Okay, now as far as why study image processing, right? So uh, relevance. Uh, so if you if you really wonder, right? Who are the people that uh, know that probably first were the most heavy users of image processing? Who do you think would that have been? The folks that probably depended on image processing a lot early on. I'm not I'm not talking about last ten years or something. I'm talking about long ago. 30, 40 years ago, maybe, right? Who do you think might have used it the most? Astronomical people, the, the, the people that were doing astronomical imaging, right? For them, you know, it actually, it, it actually mean, you know, it actually meant a lot because when you actually send, uh, when you send these space scopes and all, okay, when you, when you feel that you have to, you have to capture images of the Hubble, right? So when you want to, you want to capture images of things that are very far away, and then you send these space scopes, right? What can happen is along the way, right? Something can always go wrong, okay? In terms of the optics, right? Because of the vibrations, whatever, okay? Things which are not under your control. When you actually set things up here, it all looks very fine. But then when this thing is sent and it is already kind of say traveled millions of miles away, and then it starts to send back these images and you suddenly find that something is not right with those images. And how do you know that? For example, you know, you've never, never seen that part of the world, part of the, not world, right? You have not, you are not, you not been to that part of the universe, but you still have, you know, as a human being, right, we are all smart in the sense that somebody gives me a picture that I can still say whether this image is probably, something is wrong with this image, right? I don't really expect it to be like this. Perhaps it's not sharp, perhaps it's, you know, oversaturated, something is not right. Okay, so it's, so we, we have this feeling that, you know, this image could not be the right image with respect to whatever it has imaged. So in such cases, right, it is impossible for somebody to go from here to fix that problem, right? It's, it's impossible. You can't, you can't really bring it back either. So in order to save all that money, okay, that, that otherwise would get spent. So these people or, 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 or the, the entire, entire right, uh, no thing would be kind of called a failure because whatever it is sent is, is no good. So in such cases, what is done is at the earth station, right, people will develop algorithms wherein, let's say, right, you try to, you try to undo, okay, whatever has happened. So if there has been, you know, a degradation, then you, then you try to undo it. So the whole idea is if you can undo it reasonably well, and again, right, you have to basically apply algorithms that you, that you think makes sense. And, and when you undo and then, you know, you see a picture which you think is correct, then you know that, well, no, then you know that whatever it is sending, right, you can still salvage all of that, right. For example, okay, so throughout this course, right, as far as possible, I'll try to, I'll try to show you examples, okay, that will actually give you a feel for what I'm saying, because like they say, right, unless you see a picture, uh, you know, many, any number of words is not enough. So, let me just show you this first, uh, no, first set of slides, and then as we go on, right, we will we'll also see others. So, for example, astronomical imaging, right, one of the things that they like to do is that deep blurring. So, for example, right, I mean, this is supposed to be a supposed to be a star which is called Epsilon Lyrae. Okay, and if you if you if you look at the image of the star, it actually it is supposed to be two dots. Okay, it's not just one. I mean, there are actually supposed to be two dots apparently, right? Like 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 the one here and here. But then when you when you image it, right, what you actually end up seeing is something like that, which is actually a blurred picture, right? And then the idea is that if you were to do a do a do a deep blurring, right, then uh, what you would find is that you know you would find something like that. Now. Uh, so the idea is that you can, and you know, time is not of the essence, because in these things, right, it doesn't matter whether you do it in real time or not, because as long as you can do it, okay. There are applications where you might say that I need to be able to do it in real time, but but uh, now there are several, especially in astronomy and all, people don't really worry about the time. They don't they don't really worry about worry about you know how many hours it takes. All that they want to do is if the, if you can if you can if you can identify what has gone wrong, if you can mathematically model that. And if you can undo that, then it's fine, right? Because after that, all the images that are being beamed, uh, that are being beamed to you, you can salvage all of that. Okay, so astronomical imaging is one, and where uh, you know some of the other things, right? That uh, that let's say one can one can actually do is uh, oh, mm, this all requires a little bit of practice. Mm. Okay, so de blurring is one thing that they that that they've always done. Then the denoising. Okay, and so on. Then the, the the second application, right, that I would like to point out to you is what are called what I think you're all very familiar with, which which is a consumer camera, right? Which is something that that was handheld, and then okay, we all like to have them, okay, wherever we go. Now some of these things we'll actually do. For example, denoising, deblurring. Okay, we you may not actually do it for an astronomical astronomical image, but you'll but you'll definitely learn what does it mean to say deblur, what does it involve. Why is this problem? We'll post and so on. Okay, so consumer camera again, 
right? There's something called an autofocus, right? Which you all know. That is again, uh, it's not automatic, right? There is an, there is, there is some amount of image processing involved, which again is something that you will learn. Okay, while we go through, then the other application is actually uh, a mosaicing, which I'm sure you all heard about. That is to stitch a bunch of images, which I think you all do probably, right? Day in and day out, wherein you want to, you want to, you know, acquire a wider field of view, right? You have a camera that has only a uh, give only. Only you know a fixed field of view, but then you want to you want to go to the beach, and then you see the expanse, right? The way you see it with your eyes. But then when you actually take it, take an image of it, it just looks like looks like a small little thing, right? So when you want to expand the field of view, you want to be able to put. I mean, so you kind of sweep the camera, right? What do you do normally? I mean, you will take it and then you will sweep it. What is called a pan motion, right? So when you actually pan, so you have a sequence of images, and then the idea is that. And you know, during that sequence, what might happen is you know, it doesn't mean that you know, everything will come very aligned because you can't you can't hold your camera you know such that it'll do it'll undergo only one kind of motion, right? So it might it might go a little forward also, it might come back a little bit, right? You may try to do it like this, but then it's not entirely in your hand. Right? It's not entirely, you know, uh, right? So when you do that, you get a bunch of images, and then you can't directly stitch them like that, right? So you want to be able to align them. Right, so that so that when you actually put them all together, you get a feel for a wide field of view. So this is available in all cameras, but then there are certain. Do you uh, suppose I ask you, are there? I mean, right, there are still things that it cannot do. What kind of things can it not do? Let me just uh, no, let it not be a one-way track where I keep on talking and then I'm just listening. Right, so this stitching, right? Do you think that certain things it can still not do? I would want you to go and check this. Where, when will it fail? Do you think? Pure rotation? No, it need not fail. Huh? Ah, well, yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a fair enough answer. If something is moving, okay. Suppose I assume that everything is still, even then something can go wrong. Assume that the scene is completely static. Okay, even then something can go wrong. For 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 what kind of scene? Can things go wrong? Huh? No, no, no. See, it's like this, right? See, if you if you actually go back and check your camera, right, you'll notice that you are able to you are able to stitch these kind of these kind of images, provided they are sufficiently far away from the camera. You try something which is very close, like for example, right here, right? I mean, you know, in this classroom, suppose you keep somebody here, somebody sitting there. Of course, you know, people should not be in the same one line. Otherwise, one guy will occlude everyone else. And then suppose you have you know a 3D kind of a scene. Okay, and then if you are translating, right? Then, uh, then you would all know that, right? Uh, there is something called a parallax, right? A parallax means, I mean, our our I say, eyes function like that, right? Why do you have a pair? Because because when I when I actually you know look through this eye, I get a certain image. When I look through this other eye, I get a certain image. And then the way these image points are moving, right, is all a function of who is where, right? So for example, this guy at the front, right? This boy at the front, his image will move a lot more because he is very close to me. Whereas, right, that girl at the back, if I see her image, it would have hardly moved in the, in the two images, right? That's called that's called that is a, that is a stereo effect, right? Which is a parallax. Now, that kind of parallax, when it happens, you cannot you cannot directly stitch, you cannot align the two images with just one transformation, because because he requires a different transformation, she requires a different transformation, right? So all these mosaicing algorithms that you see in your cameras are all those are kind of the simpler ones. You know, they just assume that the world can be assumed to be flat. Or the only other way that you can do is you don't you don't move the camera. You simply you simply say rotate, then it is okay. These things I'll tell later why why rotation is okay, but not translation. Okay, these are things that we'll talk about later. But I'm just saying some of these things you would have realized. But but no, but don't think that all these are solved problems. It's still a long way to go, right? I mean, fortunately, otherwise uh, we would all be out of jobs, right? So fortunately, there's still a long way to go in terms of you know bringing these things to fruition. Then uh, stabilization is something that you would have heard, right? Stabilization is like you know if you were to uh, if you were to if there's a small shake in the camera, which is not intentional. Stabilization actually accounts for those effects. Low light photography. This is again very interesting, right? If you see all these guys that that uh, that try to sell their cameras, one of the things that they keep harping on is low light uh, you know, imaging and all, right? So that is again something which is very very fundamental, because the entire image uh, image formation, right? Uh, if you look, if you look at the noise, you know that underlines it. It's a kind of short noise because you because you are trying to see it get in photons, right? You keep the window open. You are trying to you are trying to acquire as many photons as you can. Each sensor pixel that is sitting, each sensor element that is sitting there is trying to acquire as many photons as you can. Now, when there's a low light, right? It may and there is an uncertainty, okay? In you know in how many photons you can capture. Even if you keep the time fixed, if I take it today, right? For let's say one second, 
at a sensor element how many photons do i get and after let's say 5 minutes i again expose for 1 second the number of photon will not be the same always an uncertainty because it's an say, arrival process right so so this short noise what it will do is you should see images right where if you have a short noise if you have a low light then the, the uncertainty actually will be higher okay that we will see this is called you know sort of uh, signal dependent noise this is not like your awgn this is a signal this is a function of the signal strength itself and when the signal strength falls the, 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 the you know noise level becomes more and more uh, more and more what do you call you no know, uh, so the more the noise will be more and more strong so low light photography is one thing then there is something called rolling shutter okay this this is slightly advanced right we won't actually talk about these things but rolling shutter is what is what all your cameras have by the way most of the cameras that you carrying have a rolling shutter if you if you thinking that you know all the sensor elements get exposed at the same time you are wrong what happens is there is one row that gets exposed and then after a delay the second row comes on after a delay which is simply the read time okay the third row comes on and so on so as long as the scene is still right you won't feel anything it, it will just look as good as an image that you have taken with a still camera but then if some motion happens right then what happens is not all rows see the same motion okay so this rolling shutter is something very strange okay it can actually it can actually bend a bend a line into a curve which which doesn't happen otherwise at all you can never with a camera bend a bend a bend you know a line into a curve but a rolling shutter effect can do it okay unless i mean then there are other effects like your sufficient distortion or those are something else but i'm saying if otherwise if a camera is ideal due to motion you can never bend a line into a curve Uh, but then you know a cam uh, rolling shutter camera can you know in a rolling shutter camera it can happen and that is why there is something you know that let's say people uh, you know this is again an unsolved problem you know trying to what this is called a correction you know rolling shutter is called a correction so so all these are things right that you will find uh, these are not yet there but then you know these are all very advanced things that are that are right now happening right as i am speaking right there are these papers that are being written on how to do rolling shutter correction and then it won't be far right before these things get translated into a camera and then you know they start you start seeing their effects then motion de blurring which is again a very very common phenomenon right in fact i in fact i find it strange you know whenever whenever of course not that i have a great camera i have a camera that's 5 years old but uh, but then you know if if i have to take a sharp picture right especially if i have to send my student something which i have done a correction they want to send him back a smart uh, uh, not a sharp picture Right? the moment the moment you take it in your head that you want to capture a sharp picture that is when it will always come out blurred because you just you know over straining yourself to capture something very sharp and then some shake happens and then right it just goes off so the motion de blurring is more common because your cameras are all very light now if you had a heavy camera it won't shake right but then all of you love to carry one phone two phones three phones right in your pocket for god knows what but then right the, the more lighter they are okay the 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 see problem is the shake is also very 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 common Okay, so motion de blurring is another thing. This is still not implemented in your camera. Right? Please tell me if you have seen a camera that does that does an automatic sort of a de blurring that can sense that you know there is a motion and and it ought to de blur. Okay, then a dual lens. Right, this is again something very interesting. Uh, why why just stop at dual lens? There are people have four lenses and all right now. So all these all these sim simply to know you know to sort of enhance your experience. So when you have a dual lens, it means you can have stereo effects, which means that you can get get a sense for the you know 3D nature of the world. and therefore right you can do you can do a bunch of bunch of other things and then dual lens imaging then there's something called high dynamic range imaging okay hdr i'll show some examples of this and then uh, anyway anyway noise removal and all that right now let me just go back and you know i've said too many things let me just show you some of these effects uh okay now right after this okay so if you take if you take a consumer camera right this is what you mean by stitching right you you uh, you want to you want to acquire a wide field of view but then you have a camera that can only do so much right that has only a limited field of view so you can stitch them all together right and again this is a lab assignment that you will do okay this is one of those assignment that you will do yourself in the sense that you know you will actually I'll want you to capture images from your camera and do it and not like uh, it's not like we will give you images you go find some images and maybe you even show when it fails like i said prove that you know what i said was correct huh for my sake okay then high dynamic range imaging right what does that mean that actually means that you know when you actually take a take a camera right and uh, um so this high dynamic range so you know if you have a fixed exposure right if you have a, if you have a fixed exposure what it means is that see for example you know as i am kind of sitting here and there's a light okay which is uh, which is falling on me it actually means that you know and it means that somebody on whom the light is not falling right he will appear dark 
and uh, I know whoever on whom the light is falling will appear bright. And, but, but ideally, right, you would like an image in which, let's say, all of us are, you know, all of us are uniformly illuminated. It should not happen that somebody is totally in the dark, you can't see him at all. Or it so happens that you just, you just shine so much light that you can't, you can't see anywhere at all because then there is a kind of oversaturation. You could, you could saturate a picture. Have you seen such pictures, right? It will be some portion will just be totally saturated, right? And then some other portions you can see. Now, with that image, right, you, can, you, can, you can't do much. Uh, no histogram, none of those things will work because you fundamentally lost the information that is supposed to have been captured. Right? So, in such cases, what you can do is you, 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 you don't stop with one exposure, you capture actually you know, several of them. So, 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 when you capture, let's say, multiple exposures, so you start with a low exposure, go till high. Then what happens at a low exposure, things that are already bright will be all right, okay, at a low exposure. Uh, okay, so, in the sense that they won't saturate, but then things that are dark, you won't see. Then you then you keep increasing the exposure. What will happen when you have ex you know when you, when you have ex ex uh, increased exposure sufficiently? Then things that are dark will start to emerge. You will see them, but then things that are bright would have would have already reached saturation. But that is okay because you have captured them in some other frame, right? And in some other exposure. So the idea is that how do you now combine information coming from all these exposures together so as to be able to build a picture? Now here is an example. Do you get to know this know this place? What is this place? Have you seen this before? Either uh, right, some, I mean, something wrong with you guys, or uh, this is within the campus. This is called the Peliamman Temple. So all of you, uh, right? So, so it looks like none of you guys go to that temple. But anyway, right? No, we are not. We are not here to talk about that. I'm just saying that this is something that is in. Uh, and all the images that I'm showing you are all real. Okay, this is, most of them are real and typically done within the lab, not the earlier one. That, that is the mosaic is not from the lab. This is from my lab. Okay. Uh, now, ideally, so, so, you, so you see that right, some of these pictures are like undersaturated, uh, no, underexposed, let's say underexposed, then reasonably exposed, then something is overexposed, right? If you, com if, you, if you combine all this, what you would get is something like that, just one picture, right, which looks uniformly illuminated. This is called high dynamic. Actually, high dynamic range imaging means, uh, means actually much more than that. It actually means that you know you can actually increase the increase the dynamic range of your image. In fact, it, you know, it is solved in terms of the you know irradiance that you get. But then, in order to show a high dynamic range imaging, you should have a display that can accommodate right that many that many levels. Typically, you will have like a, a two fifty six gray levels. Okay, you will go probably up to five twelve. But then, high dynamic imaging imaging actually means that you can go you can go to go you can go to many more levels, and you should have a display. That should actually show it. All these are this is all uh, done after some kind of a tone mapping. Do uh, what the tone mapping means is that you have you have several of these levels, but then you're tone mapping so that you can show it on a on a regular display. Those the real high dynamic range you can't show it on on this kind of you know, a display and all. You need a special display for that. But this just explains the idea that what what does it mean to do high dynamic range imaging? Mm. Now let me go to the next one, which is uh, okay. Now this is like low, low, you know, low light photography. See the one on the left. Okay, that is actually taken in a low light. See that spottiness on the image. Okay, that is all. That that is not really a part of the scene. Those are all noise. This is purely short noise, and the short noise has a, has a, has a, has several implications. Okay, which we will see down the line. 